Hi, I'm Jason Ross. I work with the LaRouche Basement Research Team, and I've been doing a, what I want to talk to you today about is uh, Bernard Riemann in particular, but in general about the economic method of Lyndon LaRouche. Because if you take a look at, let's see if this works here, right. You know, LaRouche has been around for some time, and he's made a number of forecasts that were very unpopular when he made them. Uh, I just wrote up four here, his 56 forecast of the 57 recession, the end of the Bretton Woods system in 71, when Nixon took the dollar off of gold. In 83, discussing the Strategic Defense Initiative, LaRouche warned the Soviet Union that if they rejected his proposal, the Soviet Union would collapse within about five years. Now, if you do the math, between 1983 and then 1989, that's about five years in my book. At the time LaRouche said that, in 83, nobody thought that was a likely thing to worry about in the next five years. And as Diane discussed uh, in, in her presentation today, when he had warned right before the fall of the Berlin Wall that the wall was going to come down, Germany would be reunified, and Berlin was the likely new capital, again, that was considered pretty outrageous. And then in the current time, the current collapse that we're in right now, you know, just go back in your mind, those of you who are old enough, go back 10 years, go back 12 years. We were told that we had a new economy, that we would never have a recession again. Now, it seems hard to believe that we actually heard that, but we did. Like, that was said repeatedly. There will be no more recessions. The economy is stable from now on forever. That wasn't wrong. <laughs> that, those guys were wrong. So you, you say, well, how is it that LaRouche does it? It's not that he's got some great sources or something. You know, he didn't, uh, he didn't sit in on the Bilderberg meeting and listen to them and say, aha, I got from these guys what's going on. He didn't get some secret statistics. Everything that he's using is it's, it's in plain view for the most part. It's not that there's details that he's got that others don't. It's that he's got a method of thinking that is reasonably unique to him and that is very successful. So I wanted to talk about some of these key concepts of economics and some of the main problems in economics and how they're resolved by LaRouche and by Bernard Riemann. One of them is about the question of money. We've been talking about this to some degree today. There are some people who say that we should tie money to something solid, like gold or silver, because right now, you can just print as much of it as you want and make the currency worthless. So some people say, like some Ron Paul supporters would tell you that if we had a, a dollar that was connected to gold or silver, we'd be fine. Because gold and silver, the value of them doesn't change. <laughs> well, it, it seems a little bit silly to tie your economy to a piece of metal, because as we're going to get into, Value isn't something that can be measured in terms of the present, but only in terms of the future. Take anything in an economy. Uh, LaRouche, in his economics textbook, used the example of a car repair, like an oil change. He said you could do the same oil repair on the car of somebody, you know, a Noapa worker, or you could do the same oil change on a car that belongs to a pimp. The value of the oil change is different, and it's not because one of them had a coupon. <laughs> What does value mean? Think about your use of the word value outside of economics. Think about the values that you hold, the values you cherish, human values, etc. They're, they're all about a desired way that you want things to be, what you think ought to be right, what you think would be good. So in economics, it's the same thing. You don't divorce it. The value of that oil change in the Noapa worker's car is more than for the pimp's car. It might be better if his car broke down. So you aren't able to determine the value of your own work by the work that you do. Uh, another example LaRouche uses in his economics textbook is a plumber. He says plumbing hasn't really changed a lot in the recent, and frankly, in quite some time, uh, in, you know, in, for the most part. So you might do the exact same job of plumbing. And again, if you're employed building the plumbing for a strip mall versus well, the plumbing on Noop is pretty different, <laughs> but let's say you're even just you know you're plumbing the uh, you know the the uh, the water system in the control center, just normal plumbing in that building. Again, the value of your work, even though it's the same, is different because you've been hired as part of a project that extends beyond generations and provides a lasting benefit for the human species. You didn't do anything differently, perhaps, but the value of your own life wasn't determined only by what you did with your life. It's determined by the context that you find yourself in. 
And that goes for everybody. You don't get to determine in terms of what you do on a day-to-day -day level in that respect, you don't get to determine the value of your own life. You are accountable for history, and what you do is shaped by the context that you find yourself in. However, we are able to change that context, and that's when you're really most yourself. So the problem then with money, you know, trying to measure an economy with money, is that, I'll give you one for example, this is a common one, is the Apollo program. So the, uh, when we went to the moon, it cost a lot of money. The payback definitely wasn't direct. Uh, the Nawapa program will be selling water. It will be selling electricity. You know, unless you want to sell ad space on the moon, there's no direct monetary input coming to NASA from the Apollo mission. However, as everybody is, I'm sure, familiar, all of the spin-off technologies that came from going to the moon, things like yeah, medical technologies, satellite imaging, et cetera, those have a value that it's much greater than the investment in going to the moon, but more importantly, it's different. Let's try to measure them in dollars. We can measure the dollars that it costs to go to the moon. NASA has a budget. You can go through it. You can get a very definite cost. People have tried to estimate the benefits of going to the moon in dollars. And they came up with a, a rough estimate in dollar value of what the benefits were that came to us by the technologies that we got from going to the moon. You might object to the number that they arrived at, but I'd look at something more important. Those dollars that were used, are they the same dollars? Right. In other words, are they more of the dollars that you had before? Or is there something just completely different about them that doesn't include what happened earlier? There's sort of a, a magical, not a magical process, a very, a very interesting process in economics, which is that the payback can't be measured in terms of the costs if it's a real economic development program. If you're buying money, you know, if you're buying stocks or something, yeah, sure, you're, you're spending money, you're getting money. With a real program like, like these ones, or scientific programs, the benefit is not measured in the same measure that you would measure the cost in. That's going to be the main focus I did want to bring up one other aspect of, uh, of free trade and how Michael Kirsch has uh, produced a, some videos in the past about the satanic nature of monetarism. And he wasn't exaggerating. Another thing about monetarism. And people have probably heard of, uh, people heard of Adam Smith. Yeah. Everybody's heard of Adam Smith. What's he famous for? What, what, what were his, some of his great economic ideas? Anybody? Free trade, buy cheap, sell dear. Right. The invisible hand. Adam, <laughs> it is creepy sounding. Adam Smith on the moral level, when he got to his really deep thinking and his philosophizing, he had the view that the human mind is not capable of conceptualizing the human species as a whole that we as individuals, that our minds just can't take in society, and that we shouldn't really try to think about how to direct society as a whole. He said that God was so great that God gave us the desire for pleasure so that we can order our own individual lives to try to achieve a lot of pleasure in it. I mean, it's good that it doesn't feel, you know, if it felt good to burn your hand, everybody would have their hands burned off on the stove by now. So it's good. God gave you that pain so that you'll take your hand off the stove. God gave you that desire for pleasure so you would go buy something and move the economy forward. <laughs> God was so good that if you only concern yourself with those pleasures, said Smith, he'll take care of the rest. That the economy will get better as a whole if everybody pursues their own pleasures, their own desires. Just make sure that your desires are small or you'll break the whole game. If you have a desire of improving society as a whole, if you desire to create big projects like Nawapa, you're breaking the rules. And almost like the Jehovah's Witnesses, they say, if you try to think on that large a scale, something bad will happen. <laughs> if you try to direct the economy, the market will get angry. Yes. So anyway, the, the, the crux of that is that you can, you can create a system of how parts should interact 
and that that system of interacting parts will create the f a good future that is the goal of an economist. The goal of an economist should be improving the economy, not just saying how it's going. If you went to a doctor who could diagnose di uh, diseases but never cure any of them, that would be a pretty terrible doctor. The purpose of an economist isn't to see which, what the trends are in an economy so you can make money on the stock market. It should be to improve the economy. Yeah. So how are we going to go about doing that? The difference between a monetary system and a credit system is that, frankly, a credit system isn't a system in the way that a monetary system is a system. A credit system isn't a different way of running the banking sector of the United States. It's not a different way of managing banks and the regulations that they have, although of course that's part of it. The essential driving force behind a credit system doesn't lie within the system that it, that it, that it regulates, that it controls. The driving force behind a credit system is your goal for the future. That doesn't exist within the parts of the economy. That doesn't exist in money. That doesn't exist in a checking account. It doesn't exist at Citibank. Nawapa doesn't exist at all right now. Human creativity itself doesn't exist as an aspect of the economy, as a part that will be regulated monetarily. Yet, that's the driving force behind the whole system. So I want to jump into some examples of this, and we're going to look at how that's definitely true in life and why it's true in economics, and hopefully show why Bernard Riemann uh, is the essential piece to, to developing real economics. So let me, uh, let me start with this. This is a painting. Does anybody know what this is a painting of? Last Supper. Last Supper. Now, uh, is this a sculpture? I guess I already said it was a painting. Pretend I didn't say that. Is this a sculpture? Is this a diorama that was photographed? No. No. It's not a sculpture, right? This was, was it painted on a, uh, are these heads sticking out? Is it 3D or is it just, is it just a painting on a flat object? Flat, OK. Sorry for being cut off. Now, this is also a painting of The Last Supper. Is this a photograph of a diorama? No. Right. This is painted on a flat wall once again. Is it a flat painting? No. Yeah. Right. So even though the painting itself, the paint is flat, the painting isn't. Right. The use of perspective introduce something completely new to painting. So we're, even though both people are representing, right? I mean, yeah, it's kind of embarrassing to look at this. Uh, although, you know, I don't know. I can't paint. But it's, it's still, this looks pretty bad in comparison to what, to what da Vinci did. There's one example. Let me take another. Let's, I want to bring up a few examples of where the future state, where a higher state can't be measured by what came before. Here, the third dimension in this painting can't be measured by the paint, can't be measured by the flatness, as it was in the earlier very flat-looking painting. Here are some gears. I want to show you a machine that could have made them. This machine is called a three-axis mill. Uh, you can see there's a drilling head the head's moving up and down, right? The drill bit's going up and down like a drill press. And additionally, the whole mechanism is able to move in the plane. Move in the, you know, an X and in a Y direction, for example. So it's called a three-axis mill because there's three independent modes of action on this machine. these gears could have been created by such a machine. At every point along the gear, there's a certain height that the gear sticks up towards us. So the drill bit could have gone down to remove everything else and left us with these gears uh, if they're flat on the back. These are three-dimensional objects, right? These aren't like the paintings. These actually are three-dimensional, right? Like if you bought a, a gear made out of paper, it wouldn't be much good in your machine, right? You couldn't just print it out at home. Now, these are also three-dimensional shapes. These look pretty similar, don't they? Look kind of like a gear. Uh, these are impellers. You know, here we've got a jet engine, jet uh, turbine here at the bottom. You'd have a lot of difficulty making these with the machine that I showed you earlier. 
take this one right here. Take this set of blades right here. If we had a three-axis mill, and it's coming in to sort of drill out, let's say this one right here, and it drills it out, it would have cut out this one. Right? The, the layers overlap. So how could that drill bit get the bottom one and then leave the one above it still there? It couldn't. All right, this is a five-axis mill. Let's get a close-up here. Okay, so like before, the cutting head, as you can see, it you know it can move around in the plane x y. It can also move up and down. But let's keep watching it to see what else this machine does. Pretty cool, so far, just like the three-axis mill. Still pretty similar. The camera moving does not count. <laughs> OK. Now look at what it's doing. Can you see how it's bending? It's actually tilting the whole head, right? So you're able both to change the pitch of the, uh, of the drill bit, and you're able to rotate it to change what, you know, what angle that pitch is at. So that was a five-axis mill, because there are now five different dimensions of action. The, the normal, the x, the y, the z that's up and down, and then two others that you might call a and b, or I'm sure they've got normal terms, for the rotation and then the, the pitch, the tilt. Now with one of those machines, making these uh, these impellers isn't a problem anymore because you can come in from the side. There's some really good videos of these on YouTube um, that if you want to look this stuff up, you can just spend a lot of time watching amazing, amazing manufacturing machines. But now again, these gears, these gears, they're both 3D, spatially. Dynamically, in terms of what made them, these are actually five-dimensional pieces of metal in terms of the manufacturing process that was needed to make them. So they're not spatially five-dimensional, but you need a machine of five-dimensional complexity before they could be made. So they simply couldn't be made by a three-axis machine. All right, now, <clears throat> hopefully everyone here is, looks mature enough, because we're going to have to go through some of the birds and the bees on this next one. We're going to talk about the move to land. Uh, could I get, actually get the lights for this? I'm going to draw a couple things up. So you got two kinds of eggs here. You got frog eggs on the top, and then I know these look just like potatoes, but these are actually crocodile eggs on the bottom. Is there any difference you notice between them? Yeah, a shell. I mean, the, the crocodile, they're not hard like a, like a bird shell, but they're, they're waterproof, leathery shells. These are not waterproof. Does anybody know why? Why the uh, frog eggs are not waterproof? Well, they need water for more than breathing, OK? They need water for something else, too. Now, what are these frogs doing? Yes, they're mating. Now, until anybody is looking at this thing, well, I'd love to be a frog. Uh, frogs don't have penises. They don't have wombs. The, the mating, the um, fertilization, doesn't occur inside the body of the female. Yeah, they both just squirt out their respective gametes into the water, and they have to, you know, they're, they're like this, so they actually reach each other. So, but because of that, obviously, if the female laid a bunch of eggs with hard shells, it would be very difficult for the sperm to fertilize those eggs. <laughs> so it ends up happening separately in the water. So you, the, uh, to move... The move onto land required not just a hard shell, but you had to completely change the way reproduction happened. You had to change some of the physical aspects of the body to make it possible to have internal fertilization. That's a pretty big breakthrough. Um, OK. Done making you uncomfortable. Now we can talk about plants. Their sex life seems a little bit more, you know, prosaic. So um, actually, let me turn, turn the lights off for just one second while I show this, too. Uh, 
early plants use spores. Can anybody think of some plants that don't have seeds that you might find around your house? A fern. A fern. Uh, dandelions do. The, the little things at the, the bottom of the, those are seeds. Yeah, ferns don't have seeds. They've got spores. Okay, let's, I'm gonna use the board here. So when a, when a fern makes, <clears throat> when a fern makes uh, spores, there are male and female spores, just like we have male and female gametes for human beings, sperm and eggs. What's different with these plants is that for us, while those, we call them reproductive cells, a sperm or an egg is just one cell, for a fern, they will actually grow. Like that female, the female, like uh, the corresponding to an, uh, an egg in a mammal, the female fern will actually reproduce and become multicellular. It's not just one cell. The same with mosses. Most of the moss, the green part of a moss that you see, is like, um, it's haploid. It doesn't have the full set of chromosomes. Like, for human beings, you know, every man in this room has an X and a Y chromosome. Every woman has an X, two Xs. Um, you've got two sets of all of your chromosomes. The, the gametes, sperm and egg, only have one. On a moss, the green part of a moss that is most of the mass of a moss is basically like a sperm or an egg that grew into a whole structure. It's only got half the chromosomes. For a fern to reproduce, it has to let out, there has to be a little female spore that starts to grow. A male spore has to land on it or close enough to it that it can get to it, which requires moisture, which requires it to be wet so that it can swim its way over there. And then the two, then there's fertilization, and then the main body of the fern comes out. In mosses, the little brownish red part that sticks out of the top of the moss, that's the part that has both sets of chromosomes. So the thing that, that, that's common for all of those is that the, the little reproductive part, the part that spreads, that moves out, the spore, requires water for fertilization. Because the fertilization, the mixing of the two halves of the chromosomes to come together, takes place just out in the open, in the environment, like it did for the frogs or like it does for fish. With seed plants, instead, fertilization is internal, just like it is for reptiles as opposed to amphibians. Then you've got your, your, the pollen will, will fertilize the ovum in the plant. When you're done, you can create a hard seed that's waterproof, just like the eggs of the crocodile. That seed can then last years and years without water, if need be, before it finally sprouts up. And uh, importantly, it can spread into areas that it, it doesn't require moisture, in other words. You'll never find a plant like a fern or a moss in the desert. You'll only find plants that reproduce with seeds. So I'm bringing those up as technologies that were required to do the, the simple motion of moving life to land required, and that was just the reproductive aspect. There's also the different kind of skin that makes you tough uh, for a reptile as opposed to, a, to an amphibian. For plants, it required a waxy coating so the water didn't squirt out through their skin. Um, it required stomata on the leaves to regulate the loss of water. It required xylem and phloem to move nutrients up the plant because now you have to really push against gravity where you wouldn't have to do that in an aquatic environment to move nutrients around. So if you tried to... Um, Okay, these two dogs, one of them's larger than the other. There's a bunch of measurements you could make about the two dogs. And if you adjusted those measurements, you could turn the baby dog into the adult dog, right? The puppy into the adult. And they both got heads, you know, the, you know, generally puppies or kittens have got big eyes compared to the size of their head. Their heads are big, which makes them cute. You know, people who study these things, you know, the cuteness factors. So you could sort of numerically compare the puppy and the adult. You can't do that with the land and the water-based life because those new, the, those new reproductive technologies, the, new, uh, the, the cuticle for the plants, the xylem, they're not quantitatively different than what came before. Take this animal. When you tell children that that caterpillar is going to turn into that butterfly, they don't believe you, right? They saw a kitten. They saw, you know, they saw, you know, they saw their, their, their brothers and sisters. When you get a new baby in the family, it doesn't look like a caterpillar that, you know, eventually wraps itself up in a cocoon and then out comes, you know, your little, your little sister, right? 
with this kind of life, there's a total shift between the different stages, between the caterpillar to the chrysalis to the butterfly. They're not numerically related anymore. Just like the, the, uh, there's not a numerical relationship between the, exp between the expense and the benefit on the Apollo program. There's no numerical relationship, a direct numerical one, a quantitative one, between the expense and the benefit of going to the moon, the expense and the benefit of NAWAPA. There's no purely numerical relationship between the, what da Vinci did and what the, the previous painting of The Last Supper did. There's a new dimension involved. It, you're crea simply creating something that's qualitatively new. So, I want to come back to what Ben was discussing with the, with the cones, with the, uh, with the evolution of life. This is something we've been using on the website in the past few months uh, in discussions of evolution to make it clear that, yes, although there are, for example, these extinction events at the Cretaceous tertiary extinction, most species of life on the Earth disappeared. At the PT extinction, even more species of life disappeared. That at these times where life overall is improving, qualitatively, most things die out. Here you see it in a, in a fun way. This is the, uh, the thing that Ben had used earlier, of modal, or you know, able to move on their own, versus non-motile animals, like a uh, barnacle or something like that. You see, overall, there's an increase in mobility. But how does that increase occur? There's definite jumps. Right? There's an overall <coughs> motility ratio during the Mesozoic, and boom, it's just different in the Cenozoic. So although the number, you might measure percentage, et cetera, yes, it did change. What really made the change wasn't the number that you end up measuring. There's a different quality of, of action in the higher forms of life. So let me take a look at, uh, let's, let's think about Riemann on this. Um, Bernard Riemann, people, most people are usually not familiar with him before encountering the works of Lyndon LaRouche, or maybe you heard of Riemann sums and calculus class, and that was about it. He didn't live too long. This is up here, 1826 to 1866. Not a long life. This is the middle of the 19th century. He made profound breakthroughs on the nature of space and on the nature of non-quantitative jumps. They're called transcendentals, to use the language of mathematics. And I want to discuss a couple aspects of that here and also let you know about where to go for more because uh, there's a lot to say on it. So this is the, uh, this has just got launched by LaRouche Pack uh, yesterday, actually. This is the Riemann Project, and it's a report that goes through um, the aspects we just discussed, uh, the jumps and then context uh, from the standpoint of Riemann's work. So as one example of it, I want to ask about, about space. And I don't mean outer space but I mean the space that things exist in. Like, people can imagine time going on, even if nothing much happens. Like, if you're just watching something really boring on television, and a half hour goes by, a half hour still went by. It's over. You're not getting that back, right? Even if nothing much happened during that half hour. If you do a lot and you're very productive in half an hour, you'd still say, well, half an hour went by. The clock ticked as many times, you know, the hour hand, moved a little bit, you know, the other hand went halfway around the clock, a half an hour uh, has passed. In the same way you could talk about space as being just where things are. Like people would say that we all exist in space. We're in this, this room maybe defines a space. It's like a big box, and we've all got positions in this room. They're all different. I don't think anybody's sitting on anybody's lap in here, right? We all have different positions in the room. What Riemann did was to look at the incredible assumptions people made about that space itself. Because let me, let me ask you something about, uh, about land area. Let's say that your job is you mow lawns. And there's two people on your, uh, in your neighborhood, and they both want to get their lawn mowed. And both lots are one acre large. And they're just grass. Do they necessarily have the same amount of grass? How could they not? 
Hmm? What now? I'm sorry. Th these people also don't have houses. They just, <laughs> I should have, these are actually, yeah, these are ants hiring you to mow their lawn. So they just live in the dirt. Shape of the land. Shape of the land. How's that? Hills, yeah, elevation, right. So let's say these are side views of the two plots of land. An acre measures, you know, from the top-down view from a satellite, you know, how many, you know, the size of an acre. However, if you're mowing this lawn, there's obviously a lot more grass involved. There's more surface area. Even though they're still both an acre large, they really don't contain the same amount of surface area. Now, it's easy to imagine surfaces that are curved. Where uh, another thing about this is that people say the circumference of a circle is equal to the diameter times a number that's about three. Well, what if you walked around this hill and then compared that to walking up and over the hill, as opposed to walking in a circle here versus walking straight across it? You're going to find here that the circumference is not three times the diameter. So here, look how long the diameter is compared to the circumference. So a lot of the rules that you would assume about geometry don't work anymore if you're, you know, if you're mowing this lawn. And you might not want to mow this lawn anymore. You're going to charge extra next time. You're just, okay, you know what? I realized an acre isn't an acre. You got me. But you can get someone else to mow your you know, very steep and dangerous to mow hill there. Well, the same is true for space. The assumption is generally made that space is flat. That if I walked around like this in empty space versus walking straight across, that the difference would be the ratio of 3, of pi. Well, maybe not. What Riemann did was he laid out how spaces can be curved, just like a, uh, a hill or a surface can be curved and said that the only way you're going to find out how space is curved is not from being a mathematician or a geometer, but from being a physicist. Find out what actually makes things happen, and then that, that'll tell you, that, that'll give you an idea about what shape things have. This is later borne out by Einstein 50 years later. Uh, Einstein's general theory of relativity said that light should bend as it passes by our sun. As uh, the work of Eddington showed, you know, taking these photographs of a star uh, of a series of stars taken at one time of the year and then at the other time of the year when they were right by the sun during an eclipse so you could actually see the stars that were near the sun. Indeed, the position of the stars seemed to change. So space isn't flat. And that comes up economically in the fact that you don't find value in the things themselves. Like we were talking about earlier, right? The value of the oil change isn't just determined by how great a job you did the oil change, what kind of oil and filter you used. It's also what's the car going to be used for. The other aspect of Riemann, uh, what I just described isn't so much on this page. What this one mostly focuses on are, um, I think this is the best one. And you know, I'm only going to be able to touch on some of this stuff briefly, but the whole page is there for you to, for you to go through. It's at science.larouchepack.com slash Riemann. He also looked at the, the shape that, um, I'll give you an example of a transcendental. I had used that word before. Da Vinci's painting was transcendental to the flat paintings that had come before it. It had perspective. It had depth. In the same way, things like the square root of two, that's a, that's a number that can't be made as a fraction. It can only be made as an area. And the, the, the page goes through it. Another example would be what you get when you move in a circle. You've got the sine and the cosine. But uh, you can see on the still image, you know, that the sine is the height up to it. The sine and cosine are words that get used to describe the two different ways of moving. You can move by rotating around versus moving by moving along graph paper, x and y. At this position on the circle, we've rotated a certain amount, which you could measure by the actual distance you walk along the circumference. You could also measure that position in terms of the x and the y of getting there. There is no way to express those in terms of each other. From x and y, you cannot describe an angle. From an angle, you cannot describe an x and a y, just like a three-axis machine could not make that jet turbine blade. 
there's, some, there's a higher power that's involved. What Riemann did was he showed how you could look at a series of steps where each one can't be explained in terms of what came before. And I'm, I'm really, to get into that takes more time than I'm going to have today. So I kinda, I'm really just going to leave a reference to that and urge you to check out this whole web page that goes through it. The reason that this is important is as a, let me, let me read this quote from, uh, from LaRouche from a 1993 paper that he wrote called On LaRouche's Discovery. Okay, here we have it. Hmm. Okay. So you see it there. LaRouche wrote that the central feature of my original contribution to the Leibniz science of physical economy is the provision of a method for addressing the causal relationship between, on the one side, individuals' contributions to axiomatically revolutionary advances in scientific and analogous forms of knowledge, and, on the other side, consequent increases in the potential population density of corresponding societies. In its application to political economy, my method focuses analysis upon the central role of the following three-step sequence. First, axiomatically revolutionary forms of scientific and analogous discovery. Second, consequent advances in machine tool and analogous principles. And finally, consequent advances in the productive powers of labor. These discoveries were originally the outgrowth of 1948 to 52 objections to the inappropriateness of Norbert Wiener's application of statistical information theory to describing both the characteristic distinctions of living processes and of communication of ideas. I countered with a contrary non-statistical definition of negentropy, as the meaning of that term might be derived from the common physically distinguishing characteristic of an evolutionary biosphere. This non-statistical counter-definition of negentropy was then stated in terms of a successfully self-developing physical economy. The efficient impact of scientific discoveries communication within such a negentropic physical economic process was treated as most typical of the communication of ideas in general. That was the initial core of my discovery up to the year 1952. Yet, up to that point, the appropriate mathematical representation of such a form of physical economic negentropy was still wanted. The third step, taken through an intensive 1952 study of Georg Kantor's 1897 Beiträge, opened the doors of the transfinite domain upon a fresh insight into relevant features of Bernard Riemann's contributions. Thence, the applied form of my definition of physical economic negentropy acquired the title of LaRouche-Riemann Method. So the goal of this report here is to go through, actually including Contour as well, what, why it is that LaRouche would say that given the breakthrough in thinking that he describes in the second paragraph, which sounds very much like Vernadsky, uh, how it is that Riemann helped give a way of representing that idea mathematically. Um, to be honest, let me, let me just make sure I'm not leaving anything out. I, I really just wanted to give an overview of that, to be honest. Um, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, one other thing. The, uh, this idea of potential population density, that's an important one. As a, as a general concept, people have, are you, some people here familiar with population density? That's a, it's a measure of how stupid people are, right? <laughs> Maybe indirectly. All right, how many people do you have per certain area? You know? So you might say the population density of New Jersey is very high compared to the population density of Alaska, where there's you know, not very many people. All right, highest in the United States here in New Jersey. Now, potential population density 
That's also a concept that you might have heard from animals in biology, and it's called carrying capacity, where people say, here's how many ants can live per you know, acre of forest, something like that. Obviously, the ants can't change what that number is willfully. That number might change if, uh, for example, uh, you know, uh, there's a lightning strike and everything burns down that was living there. That might make it harder on the ants. Uh, you know, there, there's other changes that might affect how many ants can live there. With human beings, we're able to willfully, we get to change that number. So think about what Nawapa will do. Michael had discussed how, you know, such a large amount of the agriculture, he described how Albuquerque is going to have to be abandoned because it all depends on, on an alluvial aquifer. It all depends on groundwater, pulling water out of the ground that's not, that's not replenishing itself. It's a non-renewable resource. So that the ability for farming and everything else, if it's dependent on this water supply, it's going to run out. You bring in Nawapa in a very direct and very easily measurable way, you've changed the potential population density of these areas. You're able to grow more food because you willfully changed the environment around you and changed what we're able to do. And uh, you, you, it's like evolution for animals, except we do it on our own without, as Ben described, growing wings. So the thing with that is just one more example of a jump, that when you change the potential population density, it's not the same people. It's like the example with the dollars. If you've had a cultural upshift, you've increased the intelligence of your society, you've made breakthroughs, discoveries, people get an idea of what it is to be a human being, you know, they live for the future, et cetera. Well, basically, that's, not, that's both required to get the economic policies that we need. It will help, uh, end up resulting from them. You can just be participating in these things. And in the end, it's not just more people. Like, we don't want to have, you know, LaRouche describes the need for having more people on the planet. Well, what kind of people? And not, you know, not in some sort of a, you know, independent payment advisory board sort of way, but culturally, what sort of culture are we going to have? We can't have more people of the same kind of society we have right now. We can't even have what we currently, uh, what's currently on Earth. However, a different kind of people, almost like a different species in outlook, you can support plenty. You can support many more. So. I'm going to stop with that. I just wanted to introduce this page. It, it just came out, and I think you'll all get a lot out of it if you work through it and see if there are any questions on this in particular.